built and advances trust solutions. Today, Anais and Dilshani will give us an insight into the impressive interdisciplinary work of the Climate Museum. Um, afterwards, there will be a short breakout session and then it will follow a discussion within there will be the possibility to take part and um, to ask questions or to post them in the chat for all of you. Um, but before we start, I would like uh, to briefly introduce our guests. Um, Dil Shani is postdoctoral fellow in climate and inequality at the Climate Museum. Um, her research and writing examine the intersection of emergent forms of risk and longstanding structural uh, dispossessions. Um, she holds a PhD in anthropology from Stanford University. As part of her doctoral research, Dil Shani conducted field work in Bangladesh with state meteorologists and rural farming communities on their experience with uncertain weather. Um, Inais is the exhibitions associate at the Climate Museum where she assists with all aspects of exhibitions related to research, planning, planning and um, outreach. Um, she has previ pre previously worked at the American Museum of Natural History, uh, the New Museum and the Whitney Museum. And I, uh, and I received a BFA from the University of Wisconsin, Med Wisconsin Medicine with concentrations in curation and entrepreneurship and is currently pursuing a certificate in ecology, climate and social sciences at Columbia University. Well, I hope everything I said was correct. <laughs> um, now, I don't want to keep you waiting any longer. Um, a nice deal for me. I'm very looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Katharina, and, um, and to you, Anelka, for the invitation today. It's, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. Um, so again, my name is Dilshani. I'm the postdoc in Climate and Inequality at the Climate Museum. And you'll hear from me in a little bit, but for now, I'll um, pass it on to Anais, and I'll share my screen, too. I second Dilshani's thanks to, to the organizers and to everyone here. Um, again, my name is Anais, and I'm the Exhibitions Associate at the Climate Museum. So um, I'll be starting off this presentation. All right, so uh, as, as Katarina said earlier, we're from the Climate Museum in New York City. We're the first museum in the United States dedicated to climate change and climate action. And our mission is to inspire action on the climate crisis with programming across the arts and sciences that deepens understanding, build, builds connections and advances just solutions. Next slide. So there's one statistic that's really fundamental to our programming and our, our philosophy. Um, it's this longitudinal study by Yale University called Climate Change in the American Mind, which um, we, we were going to look to see if there was a European equivalent, but we didn't get the chance. So I'm curious uh, later in the discussion if anyone knows of that. Um, their most recent study is from December 2020. And it says uh, that 66% of Americans say that they're worried about global warming. But next slide. Only uh, or sixty two percent of people rarely or never speak of it. So even if they are worried, they don't feel that they have an outlet to address that worry. Um, and so that's where we come in. Uh, museums are really powerful institutions in this position for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, they're popular. So this is a, a a gif of the opening of the Museum of Tomorrow in Rio. Um, and it basically just shows, even on the first day, just these massive crowds uh, flocking to this new attraction, basically, to, to new learning and new interactivity. So museums are popular, is, is how, we, how we like to talk about this. More people visited museums in 2018 than people who attended professional sporting events. So there's a lot of power in just that number. Next slide. So museums are also very trusted as sources of knowledge and information. Uh, the American public considers museums the most, trustworthy, the most trustworthy source of information. 
And um, studies show that asking visitors to take mission consistent action actually enhances the public trust in that museum that the public holds. Next slide. And also museums are powerful, are powerful because they inspire awe through their exhibitions. They build community through their programming and they can bring about a sense of agency. So in our case, this, uh, this means that these strengths that I just mentioned can be mobilized and they can provide various pathways into climate action and dialogue. And so our programming aims to move that worried but silent 66% towards a more active climate engagement. Um, and we really are trying to create a space for a new highly engaged climate citizenship. Next slide. All right, so this is pretty interesting. We just found this chart a few la sometime last week. It's um, a map of the political ecosystem by, uh, uh, I guess Van Jones is a journalist, I guess that's his title, but this, this man, Van Jones. Um, so to the left side, we have action and it often means quantifiable policy changes. And to the right side, we have ideas which can be harder to see and harder to quantify. And um, we're not necessarily talking about concrete things on the right side, but institutions like museums, um, they kind of take advantage of this headspace side. So even though we're not always involved in uh, immediate policy, there's a significant power in creating a culture of thought and working within a culture of thought. And that's kind of why uh, our tagline is culture for action. And there's a lot of various meanings in, in such a short phrase, but a lot of it is that we obviously we are a cultural institution, but there is um, work being done by us and other people to create a wider culture of action. Um, one, one slide back, I think. There we go. Okay, so we're gonna <laughs> go over the Climate Museum history and basically paint the full picture of our work and um, then we'll have a little activity and have the open discussion afterwards. So um, this is our first programming. Our, we started presenting public programming in December, 2017. So this is our first exhibition called In Human Time. Um, it was at the Parsons School of Design, also in New York City. It was about polar ice loss, deep time and humanity. And it really used sublime imagery to move viewers towards acknowledgement and understanding of the climate crisis. Um, this is part one, uh, which it, it was, it opened in, in, in December, 2017. Um, it was a multimedia presentation of Zaria Foreman's large scale pastel work, or, or I guess a, a, a reinterpretation of that. Um, so Zara, this artist is Zaria Foreman. She traveled to Antarctica to photograph icebergs and then made these large scale photorealistic pastel, I think, I think she calls them finger paintings um, of these glaciers. And we showed a reproduction of a piece called Whale Bay and Antarctica number no. four from 2016, um, which is the, this is basically a, a, a storefront window of a gallery. And so we, instead of showing the pastel piece itself, which was kind of fragile, um, we, we created like a window vinyl type of setup so people walking by could pass by it. Um, and so we showed this reproduction and on the left, you could see a little TV and um, it was a time-lapse video depicting the process of Zarya creating the piece to kind of show like, even though this looks like a photograph of a person, someone's hands uh, made this image that you're looking at. Um, so next slide, we can take a look at that uh, video of the setup. So we can leave it there, Dilshani. Um, so this, these pieces or this piece was meant to connect the human, like I said, uh, this artist's fingertips and the inhuman kind of the comprehensible and the incomprehensible. And they kind of revealed how something so uh, towering could also be so vulnerable and um, 
how something so timeless and permanent could also be very ephemeral and, and even mortal. Um, next slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. There we go. That's so um, part two, it was uh, opened in January 2018. Uh, it was by the artist Peggy Weil. And so Peggy created a film that stitched together digital scans of 88 one meter uh, segments from a Greenland ice core. So this film was called 88 cores. And you can kind of see it in the back there. Uh, so ice cores are uh, samples taken from deep within ice sheets or glaciers. Um, there's, they're basically these chemical artifacts of the atmosphere and of, of the, the water, uh, the chemical makeup of the water from the, the very distant past. And the deeper you go, the older it is, the, old, the further back in time you're going. So it's incredibly valuable to climate scientists and also really beautiful as, as we'll see coming up. Um, so this slow moving scroll of these, of these, ice, these icy blue scans um, of these specimens really uh, along with images and, and this beautiful soundtrack were basically what the artist showed. Um, we, can, we can go to the next slide and take a look. So this film, the, the, the artist film scrolls slowly through the images and it, the full video, the whole piece lasts about four hours, which feels kind of long for uh, a, you know, a scrolling blue ice core. Um, but the way that ice cores capture time, it actually captures 110,000 years within those four hours. So it's basically juxtaposing, you know, immediacy and, and, and deep time um, and, and where humans fit into that really. Um, and the photos of the scans were accompanied by literary and scientific artifacts, uh, which you can see in the top right picture here. Um, in, no, 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 top, okay, my, yes, top right. So in association with Inhuman Time, we hosted a large public reception, which are the, the two pictures on the left. Um, and we also presented a climate arts panel. I don't think any of these pictures are from that. And we developed our first youth program, um, which is on the lower on the lower right. And this youth program actually became a really significant part of our, or a really major inspiration for what is now a significant part of our work. And Dilshani will talk more about that later. Um, but this exhibition really focused on bridging the arts and sciences for effective climate ad advocacy. Um, studies have shown that people act based on emotions more than they act based on fact. So this exhibition tried to use that response, um, that power of awe to inspire people to engage with climate change and the climate crisis. Next slide. All right, so in the fall of 2018, we presented our second major exhibition, which was called Climate Signals. It was a citywide public art installation by the artist Justin Bryce Gauriglia. And it was in collaboration with the New York City Mayor's Climate Office. So um, this exhibition included 10 highway signs that were staged in parks across New York City, across all five boroughs, so like very widespread. Um, and it, it, they were included in, in sites and communities that were most socially and geographically vulnerable to the climate crisis, not necessarily, you know, like, very popular artsy spots that we had a, maybe one or two in, in the communities that worked in that way. And so they flashed these, these eye-opening climate themed messages. Like um, this one says climate change at work. There was also uh, CO2 knows no justice, um, climate denial kills uh, and fossil fueling inequality. I can't remember exactly how many they were, but there were quite a few. Um, and these messages were translated into five different languages. It was English, Spanish, Chinese, um, French, and Russian. And depending on what was most commonly spoken in the neighborhood that it was placed in, it was um, 
all of them got English and Spanish and then uh, a third most spoken language. And so we really wanted it to be accessible for, for all people to join or for as many people as possible to join. And um, one funny thing about this was that we had to hand code the Chinese characters dot by dot into the signs because they had never been programmed into a, a road sign like this before. So they actually went up a few weeks. Uh, we, they were added a few weeks after the other languages because they were just, they were important. It was important for them to be there for us. And so they, we needed some extra time to, to make it, to get it right. Um, next slide. So this is a film that uh, of a, one of the signs in the far Rockaways. It's basically like very on against the ocean, very far Brooklyn, far Queens, um, quite a ways away from the New York City that people are familiar with. And so one of our uh, uh, exhibitions fellows went out and shot this time lapse as the sun rose, just to capture, you know, the changing signs, the changing scenery. And that one was right on the boardwalk. So obviously it was about 5 a.m. But um, during this, during the warmth and sunny days of the summer, there were a lot of people just kind of um, walking by, not, not expecting to just see something related to climate change and it really caught people's attention. Um, and it's basically a piece about heating warnings. So obviously you see a bright traffic, a bright orange traffic sign and, and your brain tells you like exclamation mark, you have to pay attention, something's happening that you should, some dangerous situation ahead maybe. And so um, what, what, what are you gonna do? What, are, what's, what's, what action comes next? Um, and so this artist, Justin, uh, he took this idea in, and also transformed it into a public interaction by like getting that, that call and response almost. Um, especially that the, the fact that they weren't placed near roads, it was, it was partially, it was, it was, it was a, a, a condition of working with the New York City Parks, but also helped our, our concept, the fact that they weren't close to roads. Um, and it really caught people off guard in a way that was um, significant. Um, so this exhibition, this programming had 17 programmatic partners, including museums, environmental justice organizations, and research conservation organizations. There were 16 special programs and it was really important to us that we connected with the work already being done by other institutions, not only to share the message of the pieces further, not only to connect with experts, but also to connect with the community that these organizations were in on a, on a deeper level. Um, so to the top left is a youth climate mural painted in the South Bronx. Uh, the top right is a climate science for fifth graders tour in Jamaica Bay um, where the, the time-lapse video was. There was a teacher training at the New York Hall of Science in the bottom, at the bottom right photo. And um, ask a scientist, we had an ask a scientist day, which is the photo on the bottom left. And um, this ask a scientist day was actually really important to us. And um, so we had scientists stationed across all of the signs, all, town, all 10 of the signs. We brought um, people from Lamont Doherty, from climate organizations and from city organizations, basically, basically the experts that we consulted to put on this program. and. Um, we prepared everyone basically to address uh, denialists and what people might ask about like, how do you know climate change is real or kind of maybe being more aggressive and, and um, against our programming. And really that was <laughs> not what happened at all. Um, and really the, the most common question that people asked across locations, across, you know, a, across demographics, I guess, um, was what can I do? What can we do? And so that was a really important moment for us to recognize that that's what people were asking as a museum. It was um, a turning point for us in a way. Next slide. So also in the fall of 2018, in, in connection with this program, we had the Climate Museum Hub at the Admiral's House on Governor's Island, which is the, the picture on the top left. Um, so the governor's or governor's island is a small island off the southern tip of Manhattan, uh, accessible via ferry. 
and it's home to many arts organizations and environmental organizations who inhabit these historic homes. I think the Army, the, the, the Coast Guard used to inhabit the island, something like that. Um, so this was our first temporary space. It was staffed by the Climate Museum staff and volunteers. And it also included our third exhibit called Climate Changers of New York, which is um, visible on the top right. So this exhibition showed um, beautiful large scale photography by David Knowles of 11 New Yorkers who are advancing um, a broad array of, of climate related efforts in order to, to move us forward. And so um, some of these people were um, the, like the head of sustainability at Goldman Sachs or like researchers from the Urban Climate Change Research uh, Network, um, scientists from NASA and Columbia. Um, and also maybe you can see further in the back in the center is uh, two, two young students, two high school students who um, were leaders, I think at the first New York City Youth Climate March. Um, so really people of all backgrounds, all ages, all abilities, all uh, subjects, all, all fields. And um, it really demonstrated the scope and variety of meaningful climate action and the diversity of climate leaders in New York City. And hopefully if someone, people came who weren't from New York City, they could, under, they could also uh, pick up that like, oh, even in my city, I'm sure this is the same. In my country, this is the same thing. So it was kind of eye-opening to a lot of different people. Um, it really underscored the centrality of connection and collaboration to, to making progress on climate and the connection of action and identity. Um, and it was co-presented with the New York City Climate Action Alliance. Uh, there was also a digital interactive in this um, climate in our climate hub. Those are the bottom two photos. And so it invited visitors to engage with climate signals by writing their own uh, messages, what they would want other people to, or what they would want to share with other people on this sign. And it was really meant to jumpstart conversations about climate change and prompted visitors to identify themselves as messengers for climate action. Um, we, we welcomed different visitors, the different people who just passed by on the island. We welcomed classes, we welcomed tour groups. We really just wanted to get as many people in there as we could, obviously. Um, and actually one very interesting story came from two, two strangers, one, one from one corner of New York City and one from the opposite corner of New York City. And one of them posted on Twitter, I believe, like, hey, this weird thing came up uh, in my park. Uh, does, does anyone know what it is? And it was also before we had our, um, our like artist plaques made. So it was even more cryptic. It didn't say like New York City arts or anything. And so this other stranger commented on her post, like, hey, there's one in my neighborhood too. And, <clears throat> and these two people who started off as strangers started talking over Twitter, they got to know each other, they found out what they had in common and they became friends. They decided to make a, a week, every, a trip every week to go to one sign. And um, <clears throat> it led to this really beautiful reflection of um, people's roles and people's connection to climate change. And one woman was a mother and a writer and, and uh, the other person was also a writer and professor and so they both created these really beautiful reflections. Um, maybe we can sh maybe we can pull it up and share it later. But um, these really great reflections on on um, they they also really uh, validated our our programming because they were kind of like a little example of the ideal audience member and like how they responded to the artwork and how they they felt they fit into the conversation was really moving. Um, next slide. All right, so between, um, we realized that between this, uh, during, between that um, Ask a Scientist event and the programming afterwards, a, 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 over the course of that year, we really realized that we needed to foreground action. And um, even though um, action had been on our minds with our previous programs, it wasn't really, um, <clears throat> It wasn't really, um, we weren't really leading people to action in a way that we could have. And so we really wanted to make that a significant part of our next program. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so um, we basically realized that it was necessary, but no longer sufficient to educate people on just the science 
um, of climate or the, the, the nature of the emergency uh, or to connect people to their emotions. It was really that we needed to offer people meaningful actions. Otherwise they may be left feeling um, aimless or hopeless or something that we didn't want people to feel. <clears throat> so our next exhibition was called Taking Action and it highlighted actions that people could take and it offered specific directives. So this was a five month exhibition from June to October, 2019, again on Governor's Island. <clears throat> this time in a different house, but in the same area. Um, and it was inspired by the youth climate movement, which led us to host high school students as, <clears throat> as exhibition docents that basically led people through the exhibition. And on the curation, um, we were, we were trying to we were trying to figure out how to talk about solutions and how how to talk the, about the good and the bad together basically and also have people leave feeling motivated <clears throat> so we started off with um <clears throat> carbon mitigation strategies use in use in nyc and across the world then we go into barriers to progress and then we direct people to action so it was kind of a sandwich of good bad, <laughs> good <clears throat> um next slide So basically the exhibition had three rooms. Um, beginning on the top left, it was the first room and it focused on three solutions, energy efficiency, renewable energy, and smart land use and agriculture. And so the top left is a high schooler, a high school docent giving a tour to the people from the Natural Resource Defense Council. Um, the top right is that, that same room. And basically each solution got one of three colors as shown by the arrows on the floor. Um, and it was just really, uh, we, we work with this, <laughs> this fantastic graphic designer, Bonnie Siegler, and she basically, it was so much information to, to, to put into three little categories, and it was her work that really helped us create a very cohesive exhibition. Um, the bottom left shows the second room, the barriers to progress, which we <laughs> lovingly called the doom room. Um, it had a, a question and answer format, which um, maybe you can see the person fold, holding up the little um, folding door basically. So the question was on the wall and the answer was under that. Um, and then uh, the, the it's, it basically, it was um, maybe the hardest room for people to, to be in, but it also set us up for the third room, which was the action room. And so <clears throat> the, Bottom right picture shows the action room. Um, this this was a sticker wall that I'll explain in a second. But basically, the action room had um, this custom app that we created for for iPads, and through it, people could choose one or more of five actions. They were sign a petition, call your representatives, um, talk to someone about climate change, um, call your bank, and uh, join an organization, join a climate organization. And so we um use this app and with each action that people took people would get a sticker to put on the wall and the stickers went from blue to this yellow color to green to kind of show the, the the wave of change the wave of people participating and it was really meant to be this visual rep representation of um group action of, of of collective efficacy and it was really really important to us that we um create a visualization of this impact. And it was important for us that people kind of understood that maybe they came to the exhibition with their family or maybe they stumbled upon it, but there were a lot of people working on this. And this was kind of this artistic representation of that, of this movement that people could see themselves as being a part of. Next slide. Oh, and we have a time lapse of the sticker wall. The sound was a little iffy on that, but it was, I think it was just music, so it's okay. Um, but yeah, people had a lot of fun 
kind of finding a place for themselves on their sticker wall, either like really high or really low or filling in the letters on the wall or finding a random corner. And so people had a lot of fun with that and it kind of, it worked out really well. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is a quote from a response to the exhibition, uh, how the climate museum changed my life day by day. We've multiplied our actions, replacing our despair with determination. Next slide, I think this switches over to your section, Dolshan. Thanks, Anais. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be kind of continuing um, along with the themes that Anais has laid out. And, uh, and here you see a slide um, which kind of explains some of our, our youth programming. And, and youth programming is a commitment that the museum has um, that is coming out of you know, the original program that Anais mentioned in 2018, along with In Human Time. And in 2019, uh, we inaugurated a program called Climate Speaks, which was a spoken word um, poetry and performance uh, project for high schoolers in all five of the boroughs of New York City. And it culminated in a performance at the Apollo Theater, an incredibly historic theater in Harlem, um, where these young people who had been working on original poetry uh, performed in front of kind of a packed theater. And many, many of the young people who were part of our programming in 2019 have gone on to become leaders within the youth climate movement in New York City and beyond. Um, so it's really, it's really incredible just to see that trajectory and see the ways that, um, you know, the, the programming of the arts have inspired action. And then that's also led us to develop uh, a, a high school youth internship program, which we had kind of online that was worldwide last summer. Um, we currently have a spring internship program that is bringing mostly students from New York City and, and the East Coast of the US um, together to, uh, to both um, invest in climate programming and work on their own specific campaigns and artistic projects. So on the bottom um, right hand side of the screen, you'll, you see one of our um, uh, teaching artists, Trace DePass, who's a poet, uh, a storied poet in his own right, working with um, one of our students um, and, and kind of doing a one-on-one -on -one workshop. And you'll see in the next slide. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is Jordan, uh, who's performing her poem on climate denial inside of the, um, the theater, the Apollo Theater in Harlem. And, you know, from, from this, um, this set of performances in 2019, one of the takeaways was that, you know, it was, it was really, um, it really impactful for the students as well as the audience um, who was accessing these incredible performances, um, you know, sitting inside of the poetry, really feeling all of the all of the feelings. And to go back to what Anais was saying about inspiring action and you know our mission as an activist museum to inspire action on the climate crisis, we wanted to kind of broaden that scope and ensure that everyone who participates in our programs, who comes and attends as an audience member, also has pathways into action. So before we get into that, I want to play. Um, a clip of uh, one of our poets, our youth poet, um, Ota Ehue, uh, performing uh, his poem, Karalai. One day, I'm going to have a daughter. Her name will be Karalai, and she will be the most beautiful thing I've ever laid eyes on. In Cornish, her name would mean love. And that's all I would give to her. I see her with a little bit more pigmentation than others. I see her subjected to the same systems that work disproportionately against people that look like her. I imagine Carvala. I see my baby. I imagine love being choked and suffocated under clouds of smoke. Love drawn by heightened waves caused by melted ice because those charged with making change today have remained frozen. Maybe I won't have a daughter. So in this poem, Ota is reflecting on um, possible climate futures through the metaphor of having a child. And, um, and this recording is actually from, so he performed 
uh, the poem in 2019 on the stage of the Apollo Theater. And then he returned to the Climate Museum. He's now at university um, to give this performance as part of our uh, public educational programming in a series that, um, that I'll tell you about in a little bit. It's called Talking Climate. All right, so, so during COVID, um, you know, you, you've, you've seen that the museum has been instantiated um, in different ways in different spaces um, with the Inhuman Time exhibition at the New School um, on Governor's Island. And during COVID, we've moved our programming exclusively online. Um, so for about a year now, um, it's, uh, it's been online programming and, and we've developed a few different kinds of tools um, as well as programs that, uh, that are uh, kind of the debut during uh, during lockdown. So, so the first um, that I'll introduce to you uh, is called the Climate Ambassador Card. And it's really focusing on the action of talking about climate, right? If we want to be spurring a cultural shift and breaking climate silence, one of the most important actions someone can take is simply talking about climate with their friends, their family members, their colleagues, just in the, in the day to day and kind of normalizing um, the ways that climate can be spoken about and one of one of the big takeaways is that you know we want to emphasize that you don't have to be an expert to talk about climate you can really speak about the ways that you're seeing climate change the climate crisis affect um you know your own community the spaces around you the environments around you and you really use that as a jumping off point for um spurring a broader conversation so um, we'll be we'll be getting to an activity where uh, where all of you can uh, can be brainstorming together about talking climate. But as as you can see on the um, on the left hand side, um, we had some masks that were distributed during COVID, and um, along with this card, and and we'll get uh, deeper into that as well. But one of, one of the the major ways the museum is um, is also kind of. Uh, engaged in um, talking climate, we, we do that with all of our programming, but one of the aspects of our current programming has to do with fossil fuel disinformation and educating the public about, um, through media literacy, about um, the very storied history by the fossil fuel majors, um, the oil and gas industry, and the ways that these corporations have promoted um, disinformation from the 1980s to the present in different kinds of ways, um, and we can answer questions um, that you have about that in, in the Q&A as well. So this, um, these artworks are from another program that we launched um, almost a year ago called Climate Art for Congress. And this is a program for really any student um, from ages uh, from kindergarten to, to 12th grade to um, write to their elected representatives, um, their members of Congress because they're also people who are uh, under 18 who don't yet have the ability to vote, but still are affected by climate policy. They're affected by all kinds of um, policies that are being passed. Um, and so um, we have encouraged um, students to have their voices be heard, right? This is a different kind of way of talking climate and engaging with um, political processes, really finding out who their representatives are um, coming up with original artworks and, and statements to, to emphasize and sending that to their representatives. So all of these are examples of um, letters that um, students sent to their representatives. And I think, um, I think we're, our aim is to, uh, to have students from all 50 states in the US uh, send their, um, their art and their statements to their uh, members of Congress. So you can see different kinds of examples here. Um, clearly, many different ages represented. This person is nine years old. Um, and uh, and it's, it's an interactive um, kind of uh, module that uh, teachers can also uh, include in their pedagogy. So it's something that we've made available through trainings for teachers as well to use in their classrooms. Oh yes, so here you might recognize um, someone from the Climate Museum who you've seen already. Here's Anais on the right-hand side and um, the artist Gabriela Salazar and our director Miranda Massey. So I'll, I'll just, I'll invite Anais to, uh, to come back up and explain this project um, since you've been working on it. Sure, uh, thanks, Michelle. 
Yeah, of course. So um, this was supposed to be a public art project in uh, a very uh, popular park in New York City called Washington Square Park for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, which was last year. Um, the piece was called Low Relief for High Water. Um, that didn't happen for because of COVID. <laughs> um, so plans for the project continuing debuting are for October 10th, um, COVID permitting in the same in the same place. But this piece was basically about safety, shared vulnerability, and and resilience and and action. And so um, COVID actually added a very interesting layer to that that um, we're working through with the artist right now. But this artist basically made casts of her of a wall in her apartment. It was the, her home that she grew up in as a child, and now she's raising her her daughter there. She has a toddler. Um, and so she took this water soluble paper, made a cast by putting it on the on the door, and she would remove this whole like you know two foot by oh, I guess feet doesn't really apply here, um, a window sized cast, um, and she was going to make a structure out of all these casts in the park, take them apart as people came by and interacted with her, and share the pieces of the sculpture with people who chose to take them. So. Um, it was really focused on being uh, conceptually rich and very interactive and very, very active. And so because this paper is so fragile and basically disintegrates in water, it would be up to the person to, to decide what they want to do with it, even if, if whether or not they took it, first of all, I guess. So uh, they could take it and take care of it and make sure that it stayed in, in pristine condition. They could take it and passively care for it. Uh, it would probably get a little bit damaged, but it would be basically okay or they could actively destroy it if they wanted to see what would happen by just submerging the water. So it, it was basically an, uh, an experiment in no matter what you do, whether you choose to participate or not, you're still making a choice and you're still taking an action. Um, and so the installation speaks to how the structures around us all, even though they feel timeless, they can be, they're actually temporary and vulnerable and changeable. And we all have choices to make about what's preserved and what's lost. Um, so right now, because of COVID, we're relying more on video. Um, in the meantime, between between last April and October, so I think that's the next slide. We have a little clip. For me the built environment that we've created, New York City in particular, but also just all this work that we've done as a human race to sort of create a space for ourselves and make a home. And thinking about how climate change is gonna affect New York City and, and, and destroy so much of that. It feels like a very solid, permanent kind of place, but in reality, there's a lot of permeability and vulnerability. I have one more thing to add, Dilshani, <laughs> before we go to the next slide. Um, but also, it was really important to us that that this, uh, this installation, this activation at the park, that we would have additional programming that connects people to action. We really, it, we, we, it's important to us that the artist says, uh, you know, makes their statement with their artwork and then it's our job to really focus on connecting it to action so it doesn't feel inauthentic for, for the artists to feel like that's not part of their artistic voice or maybe they're, they're new to it, they're uncomfortable. There's a lot of reasons why we do that. But basically with Gabriella's and uh, with her installation in the park, we wanted to set up a voter registration, a voter registration table um, it was going to be before the 2020 election, so it was really important to us that we mobilize people uh, to vote for for climate um, climate politicians across across uh, levels <laughs> of uh, you know presidency and everything below. And um, we were now we're looking to have a table with the climate ambassador card, as Dilshani talked about. There's a lot of ways that we really want to um, connect people who have stopped to to other outlets, other pathways, as, we, as we've talked about. Back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, so another um, another kind of uh, programming series that we have over this year, um, which is online, um, is called Talking Climate. And it's a set of dis discussions that we're hosting on the second Friday of every month 
um, uh, uh, concerning themes at the intersection of the climate crisis and different forms of inequality in the US and around the world. So, um, so you can see an example of four of the themes that we've um, hosted. Uh, COVID's lessons is kind of looking at um, environmental justice concerns, questions of um, the disproportionate burden of both COVID and climate um, across different communities of color in the US. Um, and so from that, that was in September of last year. And out of that uh, program, we decided to sort of formalize it um, in, in a new way, um, having a recurring series that runs the, the duration of this year. So in January, we had a conversation about displacements, thinking about not only climate migration, but what kinds of displacements and what the layerings of history that situate the present, right? In order to really understand the climate crisis, we also have to look at the long histories of inequality, the ways that people have been impacted, um, not only by climate, but by all kinds of structural concerns, including racism, including classism, et cetera. So thinking about displacements in that sort of larger way. Um, we address grief in February, um, moving away from you know some of the feelings of shame like one of the one of the ways that we want to break the climate silence is really to, to have people move outside of the mindset of kind of individualized shame and um, and being able to process grief in in community right and thinking about larger ways of being in community together so that conversation focused on that in March um, we spoke about infrastructure. Um, both the history of American infrastructure primarily um, and the ways that disinvestments have uh, caused uh, certain kinds of catastrophes uh, in the present and then what is needed to, to really transform um, uh, climate futures looking ahead. And last month we, we hosted a conversation about identity. So really exploring the ways that the fossil fuel industry um, and ideas of masculinity are tied together um, as well as wider <coughs> aspects of identity and what it means to be a climate activist as well. So next month, um, we're, we want to invite you all. Oh, I, um, here's, here's an example really quickly. This is from Talking Climate Grief. Um, and you can kind of get a sense of what our programs look like online. Um, we host all of these, um, these events on YouTube and they're archived for later viewing. So I really invite you all to, um, to take a look at some of these programs, um, depending on your interest. You can see Ota again in the middle of the screen. Our director, Miranda Massey, is on the left hand side. And our three guests, uh, Shazina Tari, Rabbi Jenny Rosen, and Mary Anise Hegler, um, were our main, uh, main experts uh, in conversation for talking climate grief. Um, and this is what it looks like. And uh, when it's live on YouTube, um, you can attend and comment in the chat and, and it's interactive. So we, we pass any questions from the chat to Miranda to bring up to, um, to our panelists. So I'll give you a quick, um, quick example from one of our conversations. So this is um, the journalist uh, and senior editor at the Atlantic Magazine, Van Newkirk. Um, and he's explaining his climate origin story. I'm from uh, Eastern North Carolina. Each and every one of us is a climate and inequality person in some way. Um, and I think that's true for lots of people living in coastal plains. Um, you know, we know water, we know which creeks are gonna overflow when, they, when it rains. We know where to drive and where to be when it rains, and we know how to weather a hurricane. Um, and that's, you know, that's life. It's, um, that's from the very beginning of the conversation about displacements, but um, Van is someone who reports on um, displacements around the Gulf Coast of the US um, uh, in his work. And then he's speaking about, you know, his, his own origins as someone who thinks about Things about water, things about displacement um, in North Carolina. And yes, so um, our next uh, next conversation is going to deal with food and questions of food justice, food sovereignty, um, questions of labor, uh, agricultural labor, um, farm working, and organizing, and um, and where our food comes from. Right, thinking about global supply chains. Uh, so it's a lot of ground to cover, but we're really excited um, about the, 
the possibilities of that. And uh, so we want to invite you all to join us. This is, um, it's actually on the third Friday of May. Typically our conversations are on the second Fridays, but it's May 21st. Um, so we'll, we'll put a link into the chat um, and you'll be able to register and, and you can tune in. Um, I think the, the timing is good because this is at one Eastern and, uh, and should be um, in the evening for you all here. So just to just to kind of conclude the, the presentation, um, these are three sketches um, kind of envisioning the Climate Museum by the Danish Icelandic artist Olafur Eliasson. And um, in, in very early conversations uh, between him and our director, he uh, is sort of visualizing the future, the future home of the museum. And that's something that we're doing as well right now, thinking about um, the, the future space, maybe a more permanent space. Um, that can exist to welcome people in. Um, and, uh, oh, perfect. Thank you, Anais. Um, we'll put the link into the chat for the conversations. So, um, yeah, so we, we're, um, we're online at climatemuseum.org and on all of the platforms um, at Climate Museum. So please, please do follow us. Um, and uh, I highly recommend signing up for our newsletters. That's the, that's the way to keep um, most up to date. Uh, with our programs. And Anais and I are available at these email, email addresses too, if you have any questions. Um, and then we can get to questions in the Q&A as well. I, I know we're a little bit over time, but um, maybe we can kind of shorten um, this activity. We have an activity that has to do with um, talking climate and this form. Um, so I'll just quickly quickly explain, but maybe we can just play this video um, and it'll take just a minute. Um, but yeah, before we get started, um, we'll, we'll be putting you all into breakout rooms um, with a few prompts and uh, you'll be able to kind of think about um, how you wanna take action to break the climate silence and your own climate origin stories. So um, we like to call this becoming a climate ambassador. things that we found is that simply talking climate has um, a multiplier effect, right? Um, as, as people begin to speak about climate in their own lives from a, a personal vantage point, that kind of creates a wave and, and more and more people talk, talk about climate and that creates, um, it works toward creating a cultural shift. And, and so, this is, so this is one of the reasons this is a, a central action um, that we encourage people to take. Um, and it's also related to our own thinking about action itself, um, as Anais mentioned, right? Where we're interested in motivating people toward collective action. So thinking about themselves as civic agents, um, people who are able to create change um, from that vantage point and really getting out of the mindset of thinking, okay, the only possibilities for action are my individual consumption, but really seeing you know, what are the ways that we can build community together? What are the ways that those communities can you know, affect policy um, and really shape um, the political landscape, the cultural landscape and the social landscape 
So talking climate is really like the building block of that. So, so we wanted to invite you all to, um, to maybe just take 30 seconds um, to write down the names of three people that you would like to talk climate with. Um, so as we said, you know, can be friends, can be family members, can be colleagues, and, and you can literally write that down um, right now and, and feel free to, to drop that into the chat. And um, yeah, and it can, be, it can be difficult to sort of get these conversations going. And so I really want to assure everyone that and reassure everyone um, that you know you can you can even talk about this presentation right as as a way of getting started um, and thinking about you know where you are where you're located literally in Vienna the ways that um, climate conversations are unfolding there the ways that you might be seeing um, and experiencing climate uh, in your own lives so so we're going to put you all into small groups of four and and we have a few prompts um, here. And, and we'll we'll be together in the small groups for a few minutes. Um, so each person can maybe um, choose one of the prompts and, and respond to it. But you can talk about, you know, why, why did you choose um, the three people that you did? Um, what are the areas of interest that draw you to the climate crisis, right? Like what motivated you to even take this class or, you know, attend this seminar? Um, how does the climate crisis affect your, your own life and that of your community, right? What are the ways that you're seeing climate um, all around you? And if you could select a single item that represents your relationship to climate change, what would that be? Um, so it can be an object, it can be um, something that you've seen, uh, something from your own home, and we'd love to hear about that. Um, oh, th thank you, Maria, uh, if you're still here. Uh, a pleasure to have you, and and please feel free to uh, to send any questions our way too. So I will. Um, we can we can send these questions into the breakout rooms as well. But I'll uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and can go from there. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, it was very inspiring. I'm very impressed. Wonderful. And now I have already prepared uh, breakout sessions and I will start them now. And how, for how long should we, um, should I um, make them for 10 minutes or? Do we, I think do we want to mm -hmm. have a little bit less, do we want to have like the 20 minutes for Q&A? So maybe up until like one one ten. However much time, basically we can work with however much time you want to save for Q&A, we can. Um... Okay, so uh, 10 minutes is okay, or I? Sure. Yes. I think that's great, yeah. And each each person can take, you know, two and a half minutes to um, to talk about their climate story. Wonderful. And uh, yeah, and Anais has put all of the questions into the chat as well. So you have that there with you. Good, then I will start the sessions. Oh, perfect. And then I might all maybe broadcast the questions as a message to all. Uh, yes. Can you do that also, or have I have to do? Um, I can send them a message, but I, I'm not sure if you uh, also can do that. Let's see. Um, I think there's a character limit, but I can I can put it here. I'm gonna I'm gonna see uh, if this works. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I I can see that. And then I'll put the next two questions in too. Oops, I'll have to do it one at a time. Ah, but you. You did it in the chat, much. but I think I think we have to put it into another chat. Um, this is the main chat you have put it in, but I will do that. Okay. Okay. That's not the. I will do it. Yes. Perfect. Thank you for creating this um, yes. as well. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I, it's not possible to do that. 
to, to post that. I don't know why. Hmm. No worries at all. I, I think they, um, I think yes. the students, yeah. Ah, no, I, no, it's okay. I, it worked. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, yes. I can see it. Who, um, who have been the other guests uh, in, in the series so far, Katharina? Pardon? Um, who, what are the, uh, who oh, are the who other was, guests? Uh, the, the other guests. Mm -hmm. um, Oliver Ressler, he's an artist. I don't know. Uh, he's an Austrian artist. Um, mm -hmm. He makes uh, f uh, f um, films um, and he accompanies, um, um, how can I say, a climate, um, the climate uh, groups of climate movements so um when they are um make some um, um actions um he goes with them and and um and films uh, their their in, um, actions and yes and one time there was um first time i think Ah, last time there was uh, the, um, an, an artist who uh, is uh, who does upcycling. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, upcycling projects in general. Yes, that mm -hmm. was very uh, nice also because it was uh, very interactive. <laughs> um, yes, and one time there was a, a climate uh, someone who who was. Um, giving information our students about um, climate change in general with focus on um, food. Yes, mm -hmm. and oh. Austria. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that, yeah. Next week, there will, in two weeks, there will be here um, um, a, a man who is um, working at the Futurium Berlin. I don't know if you have heard about it. It's a, it's a museum in, uh, in Berlin who uh which yeah yes which um deals with the question about a uh, good future <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from an from an um mm, not for uh, the arts are not really from a scientific perspective uh -huh. yes mm. That's so interesting. At one point, at one point a few years ago, we were trying to track all of the museums that touched on climate specifically, and all of the exhibitions and all the, mm -hmm. like going towards the artists too on the on the smaller and smaller scales. And before that, like when the, our director first started the museum, it was quantifiable. She said she could like count all the exhibitions on one hand, and now we just can't. Yes, yes that's right. Stop. But that's that's good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah there is heard. also a climate museum, uh, UK. <laughs> yeah. um, mm -hmm. I think I think they. I don't want to be incorrect in saying like they were inspired by us, but we've definitely been talking to them, and I think they had a very similar. Oh yes, yes. yes. I think the the founder of the museum is it's a pop up museum, and it's Bridget okay. McKenzie, and mm -hmm. I had an interview with her last mm -hmm. last year. Yes, oh, and she fantastic. told us that there is also a climate museum in New York. Oh, cool. yeah. <laughs> but um, your museum, if if uh, if um, um, yes. It's not not so um, hard to find in the internet. <laughs> was was that how you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that how you uh, initially heard about us through Bridget? Pardon? Uh, did you did you hear about us through Bridget through that conversation yes. with okay. Bridget? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. <laughs> This is the, goes with the whole spirit of being collaborative, just to, to know who else is out there and who else is talking about this is so valuable. Yeah. Right. So, yes, it's a pity that there are not more people came. <laughs> last, yeah, maybe because the weather, it was always bad weather the last four weeks and today it's really sunny. <laughs> <laughs> we we have definitely noticed the same thing <laughs> and so i i think that's that could be a reason because it was really um yes we we missed the sun <laughs> last week 
after COVID, we had a one of the talking climate events. Actually, we uh, we all like join in on our separate roles to to help the production run seamlessly. And when the number was lower than we expected, we were like, "That darn sun! It's too nice out." <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> yeah, it was wonderful. Your your presentation was really great. <laughs> yeah. It's it's so inspiring. Um, oh, I <laughs> for a while you. we were um for for a while we always had this weird perspective of like we have to prove that we need to exist like from being a very young startup institution and like now the presentation has changed to being like this is this is what we've gotten done so far <laughs> so it's really uh, we're really glad that uh, yes but i i think um i really like that you you go out of the of the museum and to 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 try to um to go out of the bubble of those who who already are interested and who are are aware of the climate change and that i, I think that's uh, yes I, that's really uh, great and and i think that's necessary and we try it also in our little 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 project but it's not so so easy mm -hmm. uh, yeah <laughs> yeah it takes a it's a whole uh we talk about our collaborations a lot, but it really is just mm -hmm. like reaching out for for data help and for design help and mm -hmm. for you know everything that we do. It's because someone else knew how to do it better than we did, and we just happened to to, mm -hmm. to work together. I just realized we didn't say Dilshani specifically that we consider ourselves an activist museum, which is kind of a talking point, but. Maybe in the Q and A. That's right. We can. Well, we'll reemphasize that. Yeah. Okay. And even I feel like I I learn something new um, each time about the museum itself. Like the the exchange I'd for, forgotten about the um, the Twitter exchange and how um, was it Emily Rabito? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other professor became connected because they they just happened to see the um, the climate signals in their own neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And now they're still like creative partners and and, mm -hmm. and pals. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Let me see if I can pull up that um, the piece that she wrote too. So I guess we can we can also have people um, share out um, any thoughts or uh, any insights from uh, from their breakout rooms and then open it up to Q and A. Okay. Yes, I think okay. that's that's uh, that's wonderful. Um, okay. Now it's ten minutes are past. Perfect. Bring them back. Ah. Okay. They have. Uh, 60 seconds, yes. So we're coming back. <laughs> Welcome back. Some groups uh, can't finish. <laughs> they are obviously talking yeah, a lot. They, they have just a few. <laughs> there are just a few seconds left. <laughs> okay. Then. <laughs> then they are back. Now. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah. 
yes, I think we are all back and together. Um, yes, I think um, we start a small reflection or something like that, and then um, it would be the possibility to ask questions. Perfect. Um, yes, welcome back, everyone. Uh, would, would anyone like to share a little bit about their, their conversations from the breakout rooms um, or your own, your own personal reflections? Uh, yes, I see some hands. <laughs> um, so we had like a really nice talk. Um, so we were talking about how we already like live in a bubble where we talk with people about climate change and um, reduce plastic and uh, yeah, stuff like that. So it was really cool that we already share our stories. So that, that we, yeah, we talk about climate change in our daily lives. Um, but yeah, as I, as I said, maybe it's just a kind of a bubble we're living in, but yeah, it's pretty cool to see that there is like a change and, and a shift in our society towards talking um, clearly about climate change. I can add to that. This is a good window to talk about a different study that we didn't talk about. There's another study by Yale University called the, the Six Americas, again, American centric, but probably applicable to other regions where um, there's basically six, uh, six types of audiences and how they understand and talk about and act on climate change. So the, the most alarmed end um, like is very active, fully believes in climate change, believes it's caused by human activity, believes the scientists and all the way to the other end is in denial, doesn't think we have to take action on climate change, doesn't, you know, doesn't want to hear about it, doesn't want to talk about it. And a lot of the time people ask us, like, how do you deal with denialists, like I said earlier? And we really don't because the demographics have shifted so much toward people being alarmed and engaged and active that like, um, like even knowing that statistic makes people feel more comfortable talking about it because chances are you're not going to talk to a denier, you're going to talk to someone who's worried about it and like, doesn't have anyone to talk to, so they haven't talked about it. Um, and even in the US, we're very partisan and we have a lot of our own problems that we have to resolve. So I think even in other countries, like it may be even better than like, than our demographic where it's like 70% of people are in the, in the like we wanna do something side versus a very small number is in the not concerned side. So I think most other places it's even better than that. Hello. <laughs> um, first, actually, I just wanted to thank you so much for this impressive talk. And um, I am currently also studying at the university study course, uh, curating in the performance arts. And we just yesterday talked about uh, the combination of um, museums and community and also the different kinds of how to address your um, your beliefs and your projects in a museal um, yeah connection and um, yeah your talk was really impressive and I wanted to ask if maybe there is the possibility also to do an internship at your museum because um, I think it's a really good opportunity to to learn and to study and yeah maybe if you could share some information about that and then I wanted to um, tell you all that in our little group with Vivi and Sandra the thing that um, I liked most to talk about was uh, which item represents our connection to global warming climate change and Vivi was talking about her little tomato plants that she's growing at her balcony. And Sandra was showing us um, a block of chocolate, fair trade, and with a very nice um, graphic image on the, on the wrapping paper. And um, I, I think this was the most fun question to, to talk about the items that you connect you and your surrounding to, to climate change. Thank you.
Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I'm delighted also to, to hear about the tomato plant and the, um, the, the bar of chocolate. Um, because it's, yeah, it, it really speaks to kind of like the breadth of possible objects that could be a climate object um, and the stories that surround them too. Um, yeah, and then uh, to your question about um, internships, we, we actually host every season um, uh, an internship for college students at the museum. So um, currently they're, um, they range from a focus on design to development um, to research. So, so there are different uh, kinds of internships that um, you could be a part of. And, and we have had students um, join from, uh, from different places around the world as well, but our, our work day is kind of um, aligned with the East Coast. So um, yeah, the, the scheduling is, is sometimes a question, but, but we also here today with us have someone who was uh, a former intern, um, <laughs> who's now our uh, um, exhibitions associate, uh, Anais, who can speak to that too. Yeah, it was just a really great experience working with a very collaborative team uh, on all the projects that we talked about. Um, yeah, we've learned so much. I feel like everyone who stops through really feels like they've they've picked up on a pathway that they're going to stick to. They're going to they're keep they're going to keep close for their lifetime. We've had high schoolers um, become you know from people who like were very shy and timid and didn't know about climate and didn't know about public speaking when it comes to speak the poetry uh, competition, for example. And now they're like very active uh, advocates, very outspoken um, activists, and it's so exciting to like. So wherever you're starting from, I think there's there's a place for you at the Climate Museum if I can um, give the pitch. Um, I looked up the internship page right now. I think they're closed for the summer applications, but spring or, or for this coming fall, the spring. Um, feel free to check back if 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 we're if we're still virtual. I'm I'm not sure, but um, right. we'll still have online programming. There will be a lot of ways to stay in touch. Thank you. Is there another question or an experience from the group uh, you would to share with us from the group sessions? Vivi. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually have a lot of questions written down, but um, the, the biggest one is because I really appreciated how diverse and how inclusive tried to make all of the content that you did mm -hmm. like with the sign languages you had a lot of people of different looks uh, different gender different age and that's what i really appreciate um seeing this in the projects and i i think it's a really oof uh, like it's a hard work to address so many different target groups so this, this is my, mm -hmm. my first question how do you address those target groups because they're so different and then also, um, what are your core values? Because I, I had the feeling like this thing of inclusion and diversity was so strong for me to see. And I love this. Um, so I wanted to ask if this is something very important for you. Yeah. I can address this one. That's all right. So um, yeah, it's very important to us to, to be openly, to be very inclusive, partially because uh, people are joining the conversation from, you know, a countless different, you know, an infinite, an infinite number of personal places. And so we really want it to be wide open and we really want people to find a place for themselves. Um, I think when it comes to our target audience, it is really challenging because we do want everyone to join the conversation. And I think what really helps ground us is thinking of those six Americas and thinking of like, we are trying to get people who are already worried, like don't know what to do, don't know how to talk about it. Like it's already on their mind and they're already alarmed and concerned. And that group is really diverse in itself, but because because that has a, its own like trackable demographic almost, we, we've figured out ways and, and, and communication scientists have studied ways to kind of um, get to them, I guess, and kind of get them engaged and get them uh, talking and acting. And so we do a lot of research on on um, like that as the group more than like like male and female or like young and old or like breakdowns like that because it's really just people realizing that um, you know 
a climate conversation, you know, people finding common ground and that they're worried about the same thing is basically the thing that ties that whole demographic together. And so by creating that sense of community, that's kind of how we get to people of all different, um, of all different backgrounds. And also like through our Talking Climate series, through our different, um, like concept through, through, the, through the artists, different conceptual messages, we really talk about how climate change is an intersectional issue. So if you're talking about racial justice, you're talking about environmental justice, you're talking about climate justice, and there are a lot of different tracks on, on, on how like climate change is spread out and touches on everything. So if you can find um, that one thing that someone, that touches, that touches a, 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 a nerve for someone, like maybe they're a mother, and like intergenerational injustice is important to them because they care about the world for their children, obviously, or maybe they're a student and they're interested in like what kind of career is open for them. And so um, the way that we frame climate change is talking about a lot of different things and not just being like this atmospheric phenomenon really kind of helps connect people and ground people in a way that creates like one group, one demographic that we target. And that's basically our core, uh, this like creation of community, this. Um, we consider ourselves an activist museum, so bringing people together to perform collective actions for change is our, our, our philosophy. Isabella, you would like to say something? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the talk, firsthand. And my question is, how sustainable is the Climate Museum itself? I mean, how do you get your energy? Is it from sustainable sources? How much does the Climate Museum uh, recycle? Is it something that you want uh, doing yourself in the museum? What you want to do in the society? Is it like an ideal that you are presenting there? How sustainable is the Climate Museum itself? That's a great question. Um, I, I can uh, I can start to answer it. So I um, my entire engagement at the museum uh, since I began it was entirely during COVID. So so we've been remote for uh, for the past year. And but that said, um, you know the the five major actions that we encourage our constituents to take. So it includes talk, but then also calling their representatives, their political representatives, joining a climate focused organization in their communities. Um, you know, to really do that work of thinking about building community, um, changing the banks that they that they bank with. So moving from the five major banks that you know um, give loans out to fossil fuel corporations really kind of play a role in the financing of the fossil fuel industry to to shift from those banks to um, those big multinational banks to smaller banks, credit unions, banks that are really doing the work of um, uh, thinking critically about climate. And then um, the fifth ask is, is sort of the most um, both intensive and, and creative, but involves organizing your, it could be your workplace, your own communities together in order to um, build that civic muscle that, um, that Anais was, was talking about. So, so I, I feel like that's, that's something that we're also um, engaged with doing in our own lives at the museum. Um, and there's a, there's a kind of intentionality to fostering that community even among um, our colleagues and, and the workplace too. I'll add that uh, important thing that we sometimes forget to mention because we are so entrenched in our own museum is that we don't actually have a permanent building. We still basically only do pop-ups and online programming. And we're in the process of finding a more permanent location in which case it, we are really invested in, in it being sustainable and green and all those like architectural uh, design terms that I, I, I don't know, so I'm not gonna go into it. But that's really important to us. We understand that we understand that we are setting the example as like someone with the title of the Climate Museum. And at the same time, um, we part of our philosophy is that the problem is with structural change more than individual change. So a lot of the time people are given the conversation, you have to recycle, you have to, uh, turn off your lights, you have to unplug this and that. And I think we really like try to steer people uh, to the other side of that. Whereas like we need policy change, we need uh, a new structural understandings of our relationship to the environment. And I think, um, you know, as we grow, we will be, we like value our, our sustainability, we value our footprint, but also, um, Oh, interestingly, part of this other program that we're doing is that a major fossil fuel company, BP actually created 
the idea of the carbon footprint to, in order to um, shift public understanding away from in industry emissions to individual to the individual emissions and individual roles in climate change. And so it's a really actually a, a, really, a really nuanced conversation of um, like the individual versus the collective versus the structural. And we, um, we, are, we are setting the example while also like leading people through these other uh, deeper <laughs> explanations. Um, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> You also, your projects have a lot of corporations. Uh, so you uh, cooperate with a lot of other initiatives. How do you go about those corporations uh, is one part of my question. And the other one would be, um, do you know, or do you work together with other museums around the world uh, who have climate change in their mission statement? Uh, mm -hmm. We have talked to Bridget from the Climate Museum UK you probably know <laughs> yeah but we haven't talked about this so. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I can address this one also i think uh, i think i just said it when we were in the breakout room so like it didn't get touched uh -huh. on for everyone okay. but we basically uh we are able to do a lot of what we do because we reach out to groups who who basically know design and know data like the data science and know energy efficiency and and know about the fossil fuel industry and know um you know, know how to make, know how to put a road sign in a New York City park. And so we have uh, a lot of collaborators because partially because it's what we believe. In. We acknowledge that we would be so limited if we didn't, you know, have all these people who could help us. And if we didn't have this collaborative mindset um, and it, it really, it, 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 it strengthens our, our ideas, but also it, it um, you know, it's just so important to showing people that the, you know, collaboration is key. Collaboration is the point of all of this and that we can't, we can't make the changes that need to be changed without, that need to be made without this uh, sense of like deeply ingrained collaboration. Um, oh, what was the other, what was the other half of your question? Uh, if you know of other climate museums around oh, the world. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So we, we have heard of the Climate Museum UK. We've, uh, our director and their, their director have met or have at least talked over the phone many times. Um, yeah, we are trying to work with other museums. We've worked with other museums because they, they um, I think the cultural sector is starting to see the need for, for direction and action. And, and we consider ourselves an activist museum, like I said, but not every museum kind of has as much wiggle room to, to be very uh, angular the way that we are. And so museums have reached out to us for asking for uh, uh, to be advisors on their programming to, to put on exhibitions about climate change and climate action. We're actually in the middle of creating this new uh, uh, project that I can't, I can't talk about too much, but it is, a, a a global project that we're hoping, you know, if if a, if a grant application goes through, it'll be a global project across, I think, uh, six continents, five across multiple continents. Um, so hopefully that'll be something that we can share with everyone sometime this year or next year. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. We. It's it's nineteen thirty four. So, <laughs> um, I think we come. We will come. Should come to an end. Maybe. Um, is there another? I think there is one more question in the chat. Um, is food consumption, respective the meat industry, big? Should come to this tech within the museum's activities. Do you see? Uh, should I read uh, it aloud? Um. I think Dilshani, you'll have more to say about this with the food coming up, but we haven't yet. It's kind of one of those- Do you things. have time for this one question or is it okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. of course. <laughs> we haven't touched on it before, but it is kind of that question between structural and individual and the nuance between them. And um, it's still really significant to, to kind of exemplify a solution for other people. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about the food event, if, the, if you guys touch on that at all, Dilshani. Yeah, so so I think this this question and like that tension right between individual consumption and like the larger realities of industrial agriculture, industrial fruit, food production um, will be examined in um, in the upcoming conversation in a couple of weeks at Talking Climate Food, um, and and we really want to think critically about you know also the feelings that come up 
with respect to individual consumption and like the feelings of guilt and shame that I think can really stymie some of the um, you know, breaking of the climate silence, right? When, when people tend to feel bad about their individual personal consumption, then it becomes harder to turn outward and say, okay, this is, these are the ways that I want to take action on the climate crisis um, in a collective way. And um, yeah, so, you know, being able to also precisely identify, okay, here, here are the, the corporations that might be kind of the entities that need to be restructured in order for us to have more options with respect to food, with respect to energy consumption, right? And that's, um, that's what we'll be examining uh, in this upcoming conversation too. So really I'm inviting all of you to, to join us on the 21st for that. Thank you very much. And this will also be on YouTube afterwards. So if someone misses it, it will be on your YouTube channel. Okay, that's great. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much for being with us <laughs> and for this uh, inspiring uh, insights into your work. Um, yes, uh, one more talk is coming, coming up uh, in two weeks on Monday, the 10th of May from 6 p.m. until 7.30 p.m. Um, uh, Christian M. Engelbrecht from, from the Futurium Berlin will be here and then we make a break and the next talks will be in autumn. Yes. Um, thank you for being with us and have a nice evening. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank thank you. you. Bye. 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 Pleasure. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Martin. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Sandra. Thank you again. Bye. Yeah, Bye. Thank you very much. It was really great. It gave a lot of insights. Yes. Sorry that I didn't read the, the, the question in the chat. Um, the, my, oh, my gosh, please. A little bit, <laughs> no uh, apologies. <laughs> I couldn't see it. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> no problem at all. <laughs> no, the, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the questions. I, I thought the, the students' questions were were excellent. Yeah, um, yeah such a pleasure to be together. <laughs> yeah, maybe they have questions afterwards that we will email you. And, that would be uh, great. Yeah, yeah. No, it yeah. anytime. Wanted, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. And right. thank you very much. And we will be in touch. And I hopefully join you with the food talk. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have a good rest of your yeah. night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.